I'm Nicole Nicholas, and I'm a seat technical lead um, at General Motors. And um, I'm just going to go through the, I guess, the past 10 years at General Motors. So the past, the present, and the future. So I, we've, you've seen this chart a couple times, the knowledge aware maturity model. And um, when we first started, we were basically down here in this um, section of level zero and level one. And I can see there's a little bit of a lag, so I'm going to talk a little bit slower. Um, we did have a uh, knowledge management system. It was called TechMem, and it basically was just a database that housed our knowledge and that we could um, see the um, information. We could go find it, but it wasn't really usable. So, um, Oops, use this one. So back in 2010, we started transitioning from TechMem um, into E2KS at the time. Now it's called Oros, and all you guys know it as that, to store our lessons learned and our best practices along with some design guidelines. So um, we had some KPEC value tables um, that were used to establish some KBE, KBE rules within NX at that time. Um, the connector was um, in its infancy, let's say, but we hadn't really used it. Um, in 2012, we created a pilot within our interior S&T um, using the assessments portion of um, Oros to do our peer reviews, which are um, throughout the development cycle for our components or our systems. Um, in 2015, we started to introduce the issues within limited applications throughout the, um, just in a few areas within the company. Um, some were in um, the studio area, they're the design, creative design area. And some of them um, were in some other areas, just really random usage. And then in 2016, those connectors that I talked about for the KBE rules, they started implementing them um, with the introduction of our per parameter manager and the linkage between um, NX and Oros. And then in 2017, we rolled out um, closed loop learning through issues and, man and manufacturing issues through issues, and then team boards for peer reviews across the vehicle engineering uh, organization. So um, you can see, sort of see that progression, which was similar to what Jeff had shown um, previously in Navistar, it was this progression into all of the different, um, let's say, sections and applications within uh, Oros. So I just wanted to touch on the program parameter manager. I guess we've seen a couple things throughout the, um, the presentation so far. It's basically taking those rule manager managers, the sorry, the value tables that are within the KPEX and linking them directly to parameters within NX. And um, we collect them within an assessment, and the assessment can go in and um, either check math or we can individually take them. So there's a whole bunch of different applications that you can use. With the parameter manager and um, we did have a presentation a couple years ago where we talked about this but you've seen a little bit about it i just wanted to touch base a little bit that i think this is one of the coolest things um, to see that you can use um, oros to drive or to check your design within the uh, cad tool itself throughout those 10 years we've been able to transition from other systems into the other systems into oro so this is just a list and it's a partial list of some of the things that we've been able to take from another system, another uh, software or um, application and have moved them into Oro. So those are our interface control documents, um, info book, which is supplier design guidelines, some engineering driven process controls, manufacturing requirements, um, preventing repeat defects, um, lessons learned, design for Six Sigma, um, component readiness reviews, um, design standard works you know, for the, the NX, and then knowledge-based engineering. So these are just a few of them that we have pushed into Oros in the last few years. So basically, we've been, um, since that 2010 inception in our tech mem days, we have basically started to move towards the maturity, the extended strategic um, area of this chart. We're not quite there, but we are moving that way and um, implementing a lot of these different things that we've talked about along the way. So a lot of um, numbers have been tossed around so far in some presentations. So here's the information here at uh, GM. So since its introduction in 2010, where we basically just use KPEX and best practices, 
we've um, transitioned all of those per, those previous um, areas and topics into oral. So since 2010, we've had an 800% increase in the number of KPACs. We've had a 230% increase in active users. We've decommissioned nine systems to move to, to oral. And this would be from like Excel or SharePoint or some other kind of software base. And we have over 30 product and manufacturing workflows. So that's um, been our journey basically in the last 10 years. So the next thing that I want to go into is really the case study. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on seats. And um, this is our seat story. So um, on the left-hand side, you sort of see we um, follow that same progression I just went through. But um, within the seat space, we um, really embraced it um, a little bit earlier than the rest of the organization. So in 2010, we started with just KPACs and best practices. We had about 40 best practices at that time. Um, and then in 2012, like I've, I've talked about, we started that um, uh, peer review process within the assessment group. Um, and so we had some very simple best practices and some questions. And so we sort of collected those um, to ask within a peer, a peer review. And that was about 50 of them. And then in 2014, we really decided to really capture this um, knowledge um, software and really start our journey in that knowledge maturity model. And um, we started to improve those KPACs with more detail. And um, we started creating the assessments and making sure that, that they were um, figuring out the right KPACs to ask for at that time in the development process. We, add, we added um, more, I'm gonna say, rigor to the um, peer review process where we um, wanted to document adherence to the KPACs, and then we increased our KPACs to 100. And in 2016, we actually took our peer review process and we reduced it down. Now, I'm gonna go back a little bit. In 2010, when we did peer reviews, it was basically, and before, it was basically a PowerPoint presentation that was sort of set by a template, but um, you could sort of put in there um, what you wanted and take away what you wanted. And when we did a peer review um, that way, we could average uh, anywhere between six hours to 30 hours for a peer review. Um, in 2016, we tried to reduce that time for the peer review. So we had a, a process set up where we preload the, the peer review about a week ahead of time. The, the team that reviews and um, uh, basically controls the peer review process started to pre-review the information a couple days ahead, and it has become more efficient and effective. And now those peer reviews, I, I just said, take between you know six to 30 hours or eight to 30 hours, are now taking maybe a maximum of four hours. Um, typically, we can get it done in about two. So um, we've been able to really make that time a lot more efficient. And we're now, then in 2016, we were up to about 150 best practices. And if you read ahead, you can see today, um, seating is consistently updating our knowledge. We're always adding new um, KPEX or actually updating existing ones um, when there is feedback from a user or a group that says maybe they misunderstood it or they mis you know, um, misinterpret it. We go, the, the team goes in and um, changes it or we adapt something else. We create new KPEX when there's a new learning. So, in our current space of just seats, just that little group within seats, not the whole of GM, but just in seats, we have 10 COPs and we have about 280 act, 290 active KPACs with about 75 work in progresses. We've completed or have active, have active um, 400 assessments. We have um, about 80 closed loop learning issues and we have um, about 30 active team boards. And then um, we just did do like a little bit of an experiment with one of the programs where we actually um, assigned line items within the assessment to a supplier and they um, completed that assessment through Oral's portal um, to complete and were participated in the peer reviews. So that worked really well and seamlessly they were able to um, review the KPAC, ask questions. We actually got some feedback from our suppliers at that time that um, there was some discrepancies between some information in the, um, the KPAC and they were um, updated based on that feedback. So that worked really well. And um, so we're basically delivering the right knowledge to the DRE at the right time during the product and the component development cycle. And I think Jeff has talked about that and we've talked about that 
a lot within um, the space of what Oros can deliver and make the right package um, for the, the DRE or the user at the time and place in the development cycle. So through this, this is what our warranty um, trend has been. And I've, this question comes up, I think, every year, and I think this is my sixth year of attending this conference. And the question is always, but does your, do you see the benefit? Do you see the warranty? And I think I did, I have stated this a few times, but this is actually our seat warranty data, as you can see, based from 2014 till today. So you can see our trend is down. And then another thing is we also have uh, JD Power IQS scores. And um, if you can see that the orange line here in the um, chart is seats in memory and restraints, they're all sort of grouped together. But when we separate out seats itself, um, that's the blue line. And you can see that in the latest uh, JD Power IQS scores, the general motor seating group or general motor seating in the industry is number one. And we are very proud of that. And I'm sure that our management would have had a big celebration if we were in the building, but we all know that we are working from home. So um, we did not get a great big celebration, just a big pat on the back through a virtual um, session. So even though that Oros is not our only initiative within SEAT since 2010, it has been a major contributor to us reducing that warranty, reducing repeat defects and minimizing customer facing issues. So um, we are very proud of our um, continued um, improvement in the quality of our seats. And like I said, our team in our seating space has really, uh, really embraced and enabled this um, software to really take hold and um, really help us in our development process. So going into the future, um, we do have some future applications that will be um, implemented. Um, within the next uh, short time, maybe the next six months to a year. Um, we have some component readiness vet reviews, which would be basically um, ensuring that um, our, com our components have been um, basically produced through the development with rigor, let's say, or um, certain questions that are more of a, I'm gonna say a program management or something that maybe we would have forgotten, um, maintaining that we need to get this done or it affects downstream users. Um, some functional readiness reviews, and that's more from a systems-based and um, the functions of the uh, vehicle as a whole. We're going to work through reporting and work through, workflows through Power BI for the peer reviews and some data logistics and things like that based on um, the assessments and uh, the team boards. And then supplier readiness reviews, which is um, a second half to that component readiness reviews, which is the um, same kind of rigor, but in our suppliers in preparing for launch. And then also starting to get more of that um, supplier remote involvement in assessments and or issues through that Oros portal. So we're really excited about um, more stuff going into Oros. And I think it really does streamline the, the, uh, the whole uh, knowledge delivery and um, makes it much easier for the end user. 